Brattleboro resident Andrew LeClaire opened his home and his heart to show the struggles of ALS. Journey as we explore the effects of ALS on the person, the family, and those around him. Good friends, and then we dated for a year and a half. And well, I was immediately drawn to her when I first saw her. And then uh, he asked me to marry him. I liked him so much, and he was just the best person I've ever known. Even at that age, I just didn't want to let him go, and I said, Yeah. I want to keep him, and I'm glad he asked me, even to this point. I know we're not rich, and I love, we did take vacations, and I love going to the ocean with him. He had never seen the ocean until he was 17. I love the look on his face when he saw that. It was just a beautiful moment for him. And that brings tears to my eyes, just thinking about him. When we go, and it's kind of weird, I know, but you lay in bed and you hold each other's hands and you close your eyes and you go someplace. You describe and then he describes. And you describe a little bit more and he describes a little more. You, you know, you kind of giggle. Those are, those are memorable. It was free. It was free, that's right. It was free and it was ours. I was. He took the lab test when they took the blood and did the lab test on him. It took about three, four weeks to get the test results. We had time to sit and think about it, discuss it. We kind of knew, kind of hoping for a different diagnosis. Um, but when the doctor told us, Matter of fact, it just, just felt like a matter of fact thing. It didn't feel like a big surprise. Uh, primarily, I believe it was his limbs to start with. And uh, he had a genetic form of the disease, um, which just shows that, that uh, you don't need any environmental influences in some cases. How scary it is to, to have an autosomal dominant form of disease. time of diagnosis it's usually about between two and, and three years um, but we have outliers we just knew it was going to be his journey and um, I 
be right there with him. I would say in the average week I may see two new ALS patients a week. Well, ALS is uh, not just one disease. Um, there are many, many things that can go wrong in the motor neurons. And the motor neurons are both in the brain and in the spinal cord. The idea that it's a rare disease is probably false. Um, your lifetime risk of developing ALS is the same as developing MS. And if you get into my age group, um, your chances of getting ALS is about 1 in 300. Probably telling patients that you think they have the disease is one of the hardest. And um, dealing with the uh, sense of helplessness that, that families have, that there isn't anything good that can be done. Um, and that sort of drives my research to a large degree, um, hoping that at some point um, you, know, you can make a difference in that, in that respect. ALS is interesting because it usually starts in one limb or um, just one part of the body and then starts to spread. So uh, you'll see this um, um, creeping of the weakness and atrophy from one part of the arm to another part of the arm and then over to the other arm. Or, so it, it tends to spread. Um, uh, it's a devastating disease. I don't want to see him in pain. He, he's, a, he is a soldier, he is a trooper. He will fight this to the end. I couldn't be more proud. He's not given up. That hospice, it, it seems really scary because it's the last part of your life, but it can be a wonderful experience. We certainly, um, can take care of people in their last hours or minutes of, of living um, right before they die but the types of relationships that develop over months as in Andy's case and his family provide a richer and um, I, I believe more meaningful experience at end of life for individuals. We draw from the expertise of multiple healthcare professionals. I do Andy's personal care, bathing, that sort of thing. I help coordinate care for Angie, like with his other providers. I am his nurse. I go visit him three times a week on the average. I check in with him five days a week. The official title is Spiritual Counselor with Bayon Hospice. I coordinate the hospice volunteers that visit him. I'm a physician. I'm the medical director for Bayon Hospice in Vermont and New Hampshire. The amount of joy that I feel in what we bring to dying patients' lives in their home on a daily basis makes those times of sadness very much in context of what we've given to their lives. Hospice is work with living people. Um, and, and again, um, we have the privilege of getting to know them and get attached to them sometimes. Andy doesn't say anything negative. He's just a really sweet person. Um, and I've learned that you don't have to be negative. You can, you know, be positive and, and even in his extreme situation, he can find positive things and always look on the bright side. They're the sweetest family in the world. <laughs> um, and everybody's very helpful and we just let Andy call the shots as to what he can do and then we just assist and make sure it's done safely. Oh, don't you? I think one of the things that Andy has helped me learn okay. is the importance as a physician of empowering patient choice. And I've also learned a lot about what it's like to have ALS within a family that's affected by it on a large scale <clears throat> to a great degree of severity, and I'll never forget that. I think the one difference that you can make as a healthcare provider is to um, make sure you pay attention just to be there for the, the family or the patient to answer questions and to intervene where you can. Each condition that's a terminal condition brings its own particular um, uh, challenges. Because you never know what we did yesterday we may not be anywhere near where we are today. So, And then maybe what you did yesterday was a bad day and today's a good day. So um, it's really more the where are we at today type of thing. Um, one has to talk about things while someone, the, 
person with ALS still has a voice. And if it comes to the point where those discussions had to be had when they, they don't have a voice, then questioning has to be simple enough for them to be able to respond in a yes-no fashion by, by using their eyes, by squeezing your hand. There are some aspects to his experience and to their experience and, and to his uh, life that are, that are meaningful. And, and, um, it's not all doom and gloom and we're all, um, you know, we're all mortal and we're all going to die. Um, in the case of ALS patients, everything is sped up and, um, and disabling in a very rapid fashion. Since he has his chair, his motorized chair, I make sure that the weather's good and says, Andy, it's a good day for a ride. Let's get you outside. You know, make sure he got every day possible out of his life outside in the air. You know, be part of the world. I knew that was important so that he would um, have happy days, you know. Also, are preparing uh, the little ones, the grandchildren, teaching them everything we can um, about what Papa is going through. Um, will you help me with Papa? Will you help me do this with Papa? I don't want them to be afraid. I don't want them to not know. I want them to be part of him right up to the end. Faith will save the sick persons, and the Lord will raise them up. If they have committed any sins, their sins will be forgiven them. There have been some obstacles where um, we couldn't get to the ocean this year, which is one of his last one of his last things he really wanted to do, but we couldn't manage to get funding or a vehicle or train, you know, some kind of transportation to get him there um, comfortably and have a nurse with him because anything could happen on such a long trip. How does your team um, deal with the frequent occurrence of the death of your patients? The answer to that question is a highly individualized matter. It's, it's highly personal as well as professional in terms of what our own selves um, feel at the time of a person's death. And also, I think it's important to remember when that question comes at us 
The greatest time of sadness might come while the person's still alive. The greatest time of sadness might come five years later when you drive by their road and remember them. You know, if he's so brave, I call him my hero because he is. He's the only person in my life that I can say he's my true hero because he's facing this disease and he's he's so brave, he's amazing, he's got so much strength and he teaches me something every day that I, I go there, I, I learn something new from him. I, I could write it down, I can't remember offhand, but it's just amazing. But just the strength that man has. I love that. As far as aliens, no. being absolutely honest with myself, being absolutely honest with everybody about what he's going through, but what I'm going through. I even talk to someone on a weekly basis, sometimes once a month, just so that I can get things off my chest. There are those that go, because quickly. Something to write on. Like, it gets closer to the election, it's done. You just have to try preparing for the future. But you don't. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him. Sadness is the first thing that comes to mind. Confusion, anger. People are very often surprised by the anger that they feel, and they feel guilty. So guilt is part of it. A doctor did not. He just he knew it ran in Andy's family, and knowing that Andy was having difficulty walking, that and was very weak. He kept saying, "Well, let's try." See if it's this. Let's try it. So Andy had to work. But that whole time, that whole year of wasting, you know, Andy's time, and we knew that what the, the gene was called, he could have just looked at it and see if it was if it was active or whatever. And then Andy could have had that one year where he was walking pretty good, where we could actually go places and do things before it got bad. But no, he worked until he couldn't stand anymore. He said that as many times as he was laying there in pain, I um, would ask if he wanted something like ibuprofen, a little bit of morphine, I won't give you a lot. He said no, he says, Jesus suffered for us on the cross. He says, I need to suffer a little bit. It's also very difficult to watch someone that you love suffer. Um, so I think that's part of that feeling of, oh, let's just, I want this to be over. Not just to relieve me, but to relieve the one that I love of the, the suffering and the, and the decline. He asked to leave because he couldn't do anything anymore. He couldn't talk, he couldn't, he couldn't use his hands, his legs. And when he asked to leave, 
all he said was pray. And then he said, go. I said, Andrew, do you want to meet Jesus? you want to go with Jesus? Do you want to go with him today, now? And he goes, I said, all right, honey. I said, okay, you can go. And hugged him and told him, you don't have to panic. I'll be with you the, right with you the whole time. And later I talked to myself and said, I feel better about him making the decision and not something I had to do. And I was comfortable with his decision. We're human beings. When we experience a death, there is a loss there. There's a time that the church says, we are to mourn, we are to grieve, we are to experience this loss, which uh, Andy is, is very fond of the Beatitudes, and one of them in particular. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourning, grieving, that's a reality that we experience. You will mourn, but don't mourn as being a people without hope. So certainly, mourning, grieving, it will happen. It's normal, it's natural, it needs to happen. But at the same time, that time of grieving and mourning will end, as our Lord says in the Beatitudes, and we will be comforted. We will experience blessedness. I think the first step is to, to understand that what you're experiencing is deep grief. It often throws people off. The last couple of weeks, I've been feeling tired extremely tired, just trying to catch up on my sleep. Didn't realize I was that sleep deprived. Um, understanding that you're going to be tired, you're going to be exhausted, you're going to be, you know, this lack of concentration. I know he was a quiet person, but he was very intelligent. And if you could get a smile out of him, you know you've, you've hit his emotional side. The orchestra that came, bless their souls. He cried. He had tears. He didn't sob, he just had loving tears for what he was hearing. And when Father came every time, Andy was... Andy's mood could be really low, but when Father came and knocked on the door, he was just... He was just so happy that someone was coming to see him. It truly is inspirational to me because I see that as his body becomes weaker, his faith becomes stronger. I see him before the disease. I know that during his last few months, I was forgetting how he was. And it started to bother me. I said, I can't think of him any other way but in the bed. And I kept worrying that I wasn't going to remember, and I wasn't going to remember how he was. But I think the pictures of Andy with the kids and, and the family and all the outings we had here have helped a lot. That he's... I can see him the way he was before. But Andy's wish, I think, was that People really need to know about that this disease can be hereditary. Understanding of how fast it moves so that when the disease is working on somebody, things have to be there to make life easier for them. But I can tell you that there are similarities between diseases like Parkinson's disease, ALS, and Alzheimer's disease. And um, if you could understand how to arrest one disease, you might be able to arrest another. He had he was a very proud man. He didn't like to ask for things, he would just get up and get them. And at one point, at some point, I had to act, actually, Andrew, you have to ask me, you have to ask me, it's okay. So it was hard for him, but he did, he asked for things like, can I have a cup of coffee? Take the little, don't take the little things for granted. That's so busy. But they're not.